I'm Charlie Summers. I'm the priest here at St. Peter's Episcopal Church. And uh, thank you for coming. This is the first of a series. And so we're just experimenting with how we're going to do things. And, uh, so this will be our trial run. And uh, I think that uh, we're going to be entertained by these two guys. I got to know them a little bit. And uh, uh, remarkable writers and, and entertainers. So. Good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Colvin. I'm with Single To Do, and I'm here at my church, St. Peter's Episcopal Church, and this is our writer series, At The Point. And why do we say At The Point? We say At The Point because look at this beautiful area. This particular church was built on the highest point here in Laga Vista, and we love it. And I just want to say thank you guys for being here and being a part of this beginning. This is the beginning of a writer series. We're going to be taking some surveys. We're going to be asking some questions of how to always make this better. Because reading is important. And we have two wonderful, world-renowned artists, writers, poets, songwriters. They're right here. We have Mr. Russ Hall. He's locally here in Laga Vista. He's written over a hundred books, hundreds of articles, and also has been a ghostwriter for many books as well. So, you know, guys, we just want to give him a hand. Give Mr. Hall a hand. And now we have Mr. W.C. Jameson, and he's amazing, guys. We have a person that has traveled all over Texas, all over the world, and in my opinion, is an awesome writer about treasure in Texas. One of my favorite books that I had a, just an enjoyable time reading was The Last Train Robber, and it was amazing. Um, so I just want to say, give him a hand, guys, Mr. W.C. Jameson. And I just want to just take the time to thank our Bishops Committee for allowing us to be able to put on an event here. And we have one of our members of our Bishops Committee, Connie Mendez. And then our, our parish, we have Father Charlie and Robin Sumners, and they are awesome leaders. And I just wanna say, guys, just wanna sit back and relax and find out more about our wonderful authors. Thank you. Okay, guys, I just wanna find out basically, you know, you have so many projects and you're involved in a lot of different things. Tell me, what are you working on currently? And tell our audience about your writings. We're going to start with you, Russ. Well, I'm, I'm actually working on the 10th Al Quinn novel, uh, which every, everything, I mean, it's always a story. But behind the story, there's some subtext of something going on in the social situation that gets in my belly, and, and I want to share it sometime and, and maybe do something to help it. And this next one's I got uh, the, some of the action comes from road rage, and um, I, I've been on the roads and seen enough of this to know that people and there's more of us and we're crowding each other apparently and getting on each other's nerves and um, the the calm logic is to get the, your head in the other person's point of view and be <coughs> kind and, and considerate isn't as calm as it used to be. Um, when I got here from New York, I mean. Uh, People would wave at each other on the roads, you know. Now they buzz by and honk at the deer and, and uh, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, try to run you off the road. So I, I thought it'd be time to, to do something that deals with the, the nature of anger, you know, and, and, and how you moderate it and how you get above it to, to say, you know, you're better than that. And uh, so it's, and it's got to happen with people in awful situations. So I'll have a lot of fun. Awesome. Awesome. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. And WC, tell us about your writing. Which part of it is your passion? Because you have a wide variety of things that you're working on. Uh, passion. Um, I'm passionate about all of it. It's, uh, I'm passionate about the whole notion of having the opportunity to create, uh, to be creative. Uh, I, I, most of my books are nonfiction, and so I'm, I, I'm passionate about history. I'm passionate about telling the truth about history. I have uh, four series going right now. Uh, interestingly, they're all accidental series. I never started out with the notion of having a series at all. But the success of the uh, early books led to series. But the the uh, the first series is what the publishers refer to as the uh, they call it whatever they call it W. C. Jameson's Lost Mine and Buried Treasure series or something like that. It has forty six books and counting uh, right now. Uh, ever since I was a teenager, I've been a professional treasure hunter uh, in this country and in Mexico. Uh, I tried Jamaica for a while. It didn't work out. And I'm still active. I just got back. I'm still recovering from a, uh, a treasure <clears throat> recovery operation in uh, Virginia uh, a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't work out either, but it was, uh, it was an adventure. Uh, another series I've got, oh, and I, I might point out, you, you probably, if you watch TV much, there are a lot of TV shows uh, about lost mines and buried treasures and things like that. I get calls from the History Channel and a bunch of other channels to uh, uh, be a, a uh, quote unquote an expert simply because I wrote the book. They presume I'm an expert, but they, they have based a number of documentaries and a number of, of series episodes on either my books or chapters of my books. So I get to do uh, uh, a lot of filming with the History Channel, Travel Channel, Discovery Channel, and all these other channels that I never watch. I don't even know what the names of, of, of them are. Um, but I usually wind up having fun. Uh, and then as a result of being on TV, other publishers contact me and say, we saw you on TV. I mean, because when, when I'm on TV and I'm, I'm talking about some treasure, they'll, they'll, they'll have you seen this, it'll, it'll be my image, and it'll be my name under the image, and then it'll have the name of the book that the show is about. Uh, well, for the next two or three weeks, those, the sales of that book spikes. And so other publishers notice this and say, can we get in on this too? So right now, this Lost Minds and Buried Treasure series has something like six different publishers. And it's, um, I'm uh, so far keeping up with it, but it's, uh, it's, it's been fun. Another series I've got uh, is, it's called the Train Robbery Series. You mentioned the last train robbery. The most successful, I bet you didn't know this, the most successful train robber in the history of the United States, uh, he robbed more money than Jesse James, Butch Cassidy, the Daltons, and the Doolins all put together. And nobody's ever heard of him. And he's from Texas. His name is Willis Newton. He's from Uvalde, Texas, and uh, he's, he's, he's Willis Newton, uh, and it was a, a joy working on, on that book. I just turned in uh, last week the, the fourth installment of that series. It's called uh, Old West Train Robbers and Their Historic Heist. That's the, the uh, publisher's working title for that. This has been fun. If you want to know how to rob a train, uh, check out these books. It, it's, it's not a how-to, but by the time you get finished, you'll know, you'll know how to rob one. And do you know why people don't rob trains anymore? Any idea? They don't ship anything valuable on trains. Yeah. Money is shipped now. Well, it, elect, <laughs> electronic, yeah, electronic. Another, ep, another series I've got is uh, it's called the Beyond the Grave series. I started out, the first book was uh, Billy the Kid, Beyond the Grave. Uh, there's always been some controversy on whether or not Sheriff Pat Garrett actually shot Billy the Kid. There had been whisperings and uh, some interesting developments with regard to, to the fact that Billy the Kid uh, survived all of this and went on to live a, a somewhat long, not particularly happy life. Anyway, we did the research, the investigation. It took, it took a couple of decades, but the book came out. It's called Billy the Kid Beyond the Grave. That's the book that started getting me a lot of the FaceTime on, uh, on TV. 
Uh, it's been in circulation for, I think it's in the 17th year, and up until two years ago, up until COVID started, every year that that book was out sold more copies than it did the previous year. And it got, I think I did seven or eight History Channel, Discovery Channel episodes on that. Other books in that series are Butch Cassidy, Beyond the Grave. What do you know about Butch Cassidy in the movie, right? Most of the stuff in that movie uh, is not true. That movie was based on a novel. Novel, as you know, is, is fiction. Uh, we found Butch Cassidy. He came back from Bolivia, and he uh, lived out his life uh, in the American West and died in Spokane, Washington, an old man under an alias. A third book in that series was John Wilkes Booth, Beyond the Grave, same thing. Uh, Booth got away, and we found him. We know what happened to him. And the fourth book in the series, and this is one of the most successful ones, it was, I've always been uh, uh, bothered by the whole notion of Amelia Earhart uh, mysteriously going down in the Pacific. And I decided to invest a lot of time on uh, researching this and trying to find out what happened. And I was aided somewhat with the, uh, the, uh, the, the Freedom of Information Act, which now uh, allowed me to have access to stuff that heretofore had been uh, quote unquote top secret. Um, Amelia Earhart quite possibly was shot down in the Pacific, but she landed safely. She and her pilot, Captain Noonan, landed safely. And uh, they were captured by the Japanese. She was a prisoner of the Japanese for six years. She was repatriated after the war was over when the OSS uh, went to China. And, and at that time, uh, Japan had occupied China. Uh, China's prisons were on the, on the uh, Chinese, or uh, Japan's prisoners were on the Chinese coast. Uh, they were liberating people out of these prisons, and guess who they found? Amelia Earhart. She was re re repatriated under an alias back in the United States. The question is, why? Because she was America's hero. She was the most popular woman yes. in America, if not the world, uh, until she went down in 1937. Um, as it turns out, Amelia Earhart was a spy. Her plane had been fitted with cameras, and part of her mission was to fly over Japanese mandated islands in the Pacific and then take photographs. And the Japanese figured this out. That's why they shot her down. Um, she may have also been, you know who, you remember who Tokyo Rose was? This, this was a female broadcaster who would broadcast over live radio to the troops in the, in, that were fighting in the Japanese islands, the Philippines and places like this, and, the, and this charming, uh, Anglo voice would say, uh, say, while you're fighting here, allegedly to, uh, for your country and everything, your wives and your girlfriends are, are messing around with your brother-in-law and things like this, to try to demoralize our troops. And it turns out that Amelia Earhart may have been forced to have been one of those Tokyo Roses. So when she was repatriated, she was repatriated under another name because she had been a spy for the government. Now, understand, back then, spy was not it, spy was a dirty word, you know, and it was, it remained a dirty word until the James Bond movies came out and then spy became a glamorous kind of a thing. She came back, they did not want to know, the, the, the government did not want the public to know what her role was, and she didn't want the public to know about her role as Tokyo Rose and having collaborated with the Japanese. We found her, we found her. She lived under an alias, uh, the name was Irene Bolan. And she lived through, uh, she, she, she passed away sometime in the 1960s in New Jersey. And uh, there's a whole variety of mysteries surrounding this woman, but the whole story is told in detail uh, here. I have another series. That is amazing. That is another, amazing. I have yes. another series, and I can't even remember what that other series was. What's my other series? Um, anyway, I have a, a novel that I wrote. But this is my latest book, by the way. Um, oh, the other series, it's called the Cold Case Series, where yeah. we look into these mysteries, uh, unsolved uh, mysteries throughout most of the American West. Now, I had enough for the state of Texas, so I did a whole book on unsolved mysteries of Texas. It includes unsolved mysteries of uh, uh, revolving around some famous Texas outlaws, some famous Texas lost mines and buried treasures, some ghost stories, and uh, some hauntings, and uh, some other things. This was a fun book. Read. And I might also say, I don't want to take up too much time, 
uh, I decided to do because uh, uh, Russ promised this would be so much fun. I, I'm also a songwriter. I've recorded over the years something like 10 CDs. I still perform. I'm, uh, I'm going, I've been on tour um, in Europe a couple years ago. I was on tour earlier this year, going on tour later this year. But anyway, I brought CDs and I thought uh, for everybody that buys a book, I'm just going to give you a CD. You can pick whatever CD or two or three if you want as a gift. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. I mean, thank you, WC, too. You both gave us a really good overview as far as your projects. Some of the questions I have, because your books have a lot of imagery and a lot of detail, where you talk about Texas in very succinct detail. Like, for instance, Russ, I really love your book, Love and Pirates. Love and Pirates was awesome. I just want to show what this book is. It's Love and Pirates. And it tells a wonderful story that it reminded me of a modernized love story. And I love the way, I won't spoil how it ended, but it was an amazing read. And it was such an amazing read for me because I'm so used to this digital world. So it gave me an opportunity to just relax, read, and digest. And the characters were just amazing. What was your inspiration on Love and Pirates? Well, it was just an idea at first of someone young and coming to a, a time in their life where the, the world was an open road sort of a thing. But I'll tell you a secret about, we both have a passion for this, is the research that goes behind the stories. So this takes place in a yacht that's being shipped across America. Well, there was the idea. So then I had to figure out, well, are yachts really shipped across America? And they are. And uh, then uh, what kind of a yacht was it? What size and dimension? So I, I got to where I could see and feel it, you know. So I'd know where the hatches are and everything. And uh, just like when I do the Westerns, I would love to have every detail of a general store, everything, and to go back and read it. And when I do treasures, I would go to WC's books because he had a lot of detail on that. And I could weave that in if I'm doing Jim Boyd's Buried Treasure or something like that. But in this one, I mean, there was all this stuff I had to know. So they're going to go all these places and they're going through Arkansas. What happens in Arkansas? You know, and they mentioned the, the diamond and ruby mine. And, and uh, there, there's places I've never been that are in the book. But I have to see them clearly in my head. Exactly, exactly. Like, I love the uh, visualization that you gave for New Mexico, the land of the enchantment. Yeah. And it was phenomenal. I thought a lot of the, the colors and the time frames, the altercations was for the location. I thought it was amazing. Well, Stephen King said in his book on a memoir on writing, he said, good description begins in the mind of the writer, but it has to end in the mind of the reader. So when you take over, now it's happening in your head. And you're seeing the things and you're feeling things and you're smelling the, uh, the, the where you are right now. That's your, your experience. And so I start the ball rolling, but it has to end up with you feeling it. Exactly. Exactly. And then WC, just to go back to the last train robber. You know, I've heard of Willis Newton. I've heard of the Newton gang. Uh, I've seen movies being made about Willis Newton because he was from Uvalde. So that's not too far from here. Um, or he, his last days, he ended up in Uvalde. But I really like the fact that you gave us detailed information. And it was almost like you were the one interviewing him. So one of the questions I have is, how were you able to get all of the details in, in the gathering process for someone that's a new writer that's wanting to be a historian? How do you get that type of information? Uh, I, it, it, it basically, uh, every time I do a book, it, it winds up being a love affair between me and the book. Uh, Willis Newton, from Texas, born and raised in Texas, committed bank robberies and train robberies all over the country, but came back to Texas. Uh, he was, he's one of, of, of tens of thousands of amazing Texas characters. It's, it's, it's easy to write about. Texas characters, it, it, it is for me anyway. I'm from West Texas, 
you're from West Texas. I'm from West you know Texas I mean? too. You know, what I'm, you know what I'm talking about? Yes. And so I could relate to this guy, and I thought, here's a colorful person that has never had the justice done. To him. I mean, he was he was an outlaw. He broke the law. He admitted it. Uh, but he was colorful. We love outlaws. We love outlaws. Okay. And we 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 love right train robberies, and, and you know, it's it's I'm making a living off of this stuff. Um, and so I chased down uh, interviews that had been done with him. I also chased down uh, dozens of newspaper articles that were printed uh, at the time that he had robbed banks and uh, robbed trains. And I felt like I came, I came to know this man who was the leader of the Newton gang, the Newton boys, uh, that consisted of basically him and, his, and three of his brothers and a couple of other people that would come uh, in and out from time to time. And I wanted to, I wanted to treat, uh, and see if you agree with me here, I wanted to treat Willis Newton uh, for what he was. He was an outlaw, but he was a successful outlaw. And as such, he deserved a certain type of respect. And so I treated him with a certain level of, of dignity, I suppose. Right, right. Uh, and he also liked to get people that were helpers but he really strategically looked for the right individual. Right. And that's what I admired. Right. And uh, I, I felt like I came to know him. I thought, this, this is a guy, uh, I, I wish I had been his neighbor. I actually talked to people who were his neighbors in Uvalde that knew him when he was, when he was still alive. But I thought, I'd like to live next door to this guy just to listen to the stories mm -hmm. that, he would, uh, that he would tell. But I tried to capture some of this some of this charm, some of this daring do, some of this adventure uh, into uh, this book. And, um, and thank you for bringing Well, I on. think you did an awesome job. I really you. thought you did. I mean, especially there were, what was amazing to me also was that there are robberies that were in like Bernie. Mm -hmm. Bernie, Texas, mm -hmm. who would have thought? But, Mar Marble Falls. Yes. Yeah. So that was amazing. I liked that aspect. And, you know, I, I also wanted to ask you a question because I also looked at The Lost Treasures and American Story. And I have one of my dearest friends that wasn't able to be here tonight. She's a retired school teacher. And she wanted to ask the question, who inspired, what person inspired you to become a writer? Uh, this is actually an easy question. Um, I was inspired by two writers, one a fiction writer and one a, a nonfiction writer, a folklorist. Uh, my first library, this may give you some idea of my age, my first library was a bookmobile that came to the school that I went to. I was in the fifth grade. I was 10 years old. And, uh, I remember uh, first stepping into the bookmobile and being bombarded with the, the sight of all of these books and the smell, oh, wow. the smell of the books. And, and as, I, as I touched these books, I looked at these titles. I had no idea. I was 10 years old. I had no clue. But there, I, I, there, was, a, there was a level of, of something akin to a prim primitive kind of reverence. And I, would, I remember touching the spines of these books thinking, what is, what is in here? And I, I, come to, I come to realize later that these were adventures in these books. Most of my adventures, by the way, have started in the library. I checked out two books that day. The fiction writer was Edgar Rice Burroughs, and the book was Tarzan of the Apes. Okay. Great story. A great story. I was just enthralled. An adventure. An adventure. The second book I checked out was... Coronado's Children by the great Texas writer, J. Frank Dobie. Uh, J. Frank Dobie probably is as responsible, uh, the late and great J. Frank Dobie is as responsible as anybody for me having an interest in capturing these stories of lost minds and buried treasures, placing them in, in, in book form. According to my publishers, I'm the best-selling treasure author in America today, whatever that means. Uh, but I owe a lot of that to J. Frank Dobie, who paved the way. Oh, that's that's awesome. That was my inspiration. And uh, I, to this day, I still read his books. 
with the idea of learning something just simply because of the, the clear and succinct way, clear and succinct way that he wrote and, and communicated these notions and these, these ideas. Amazing. Thank you for that. And just going back to you, Russ, you know, we've talked a lot and you told me that your beginnings was poetry. Yeah. And we have your poetry book. Tell me about this. Well, I I think, um, and, and, and W.C. writes books of poetry too, and, and uh, he's given some uh, lessons on it and, with groups. And uh, it's it was something to me that a thing in your mind can be a lot of things, and it can turn into a, a novel, it can turn into a nonfiction book, or it can turn into a poetry. A, a, a poem is something that can be shared in no other way in my mind. And it's, a, it's an essence of feeling. We've talked about how feeling is at the heart of all the communication we do with these things. And, and to me, to do a, a, a poem that, that goes beyond something you can say in 40,000 words. You know, it's, there it is in, in, in maybe 14 lines. And, and, it, and it's profound and you can feel it. And it stays with you. And maybe somebody, somebody memorizes it because it, it, it helps them or it encourages them or it makes them feel good. You know. Awesome. Do you have a favorite poem that's in this book? Well, as I, I mentioned the other day when mm -hmm. we were having dinner that when I was a little boy, my grandfather um, raised bees. And um, I had wrote a poem about the little boy who watched the bees. And, and uh, A little boy that that watched well, the bees. Well, and when my grandfather died, they all formed a big cloud flew away. Oh, awesome. Awesome. That's awesome. been a long time ago, and I can't talk about it yet. Okay, that's good. We definitely appreciate it. I'm looking forward to reading some of your poetry. Now, I don't know if I could find a quickie in there, but, but we, we should make WC do one of his, too. Okay, okay. Well, you can flip through it, and when you're ready to go through it, we'll definitely go through it. This, this is this is you know who Don Quixote is, and um, I, I, I like to picture things happening that wouldn't normally happen. And um, Don Quixote at dawn, <clears throat> it is a fit, it is as if in the morning, drawn by a vacuum, I fail to understand. My soul creeps out past the first edges of splintering light over the carpet to the cold mantelpiece, into the statue of burnished brass to glimmer in the shafts of each new sun's evidence. Even in the seemingly soft care of my making, I was hammered in spirit of an anvil of force, melted and molded with a firm pounding hand, shaped as a statue to stand through night, Don Quixote with spear and a visor <coughs> shut tight. And now in my vigil of quiet brass faith, I stand, never nodding to glimmering fate, but oh, how this cold, very cold mantle sucks at the warmth I once had in flesh. Its stony heart draws upon my heat, never restoring, never renewing. What we want to do now is listen to one of your songs. Just one. And then we're going to take a break. <laughs> and then we're going to let the audience ask questions. Okay. <coughs> Are you going to give him Ray Rogers? I was uh, ordered to bring this guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, ordered to do this song. Uh, a quick uh, backstory: the song I, I, I was recording a recording studio in uh, Kingsland, Texas, and I was staying at a ranch in Marble Falls. And I was driving to. Uh, we needed one song to finish up as CD, and uh, I didn't know it, it, it was it was it was all original music. And uh, I didn't. I wasn't sure what I wanted to put on that uh, CD that would fit. And um, so I'm, I'm I'm driving to the studio. It's about a 15 mile uh, drive from where I was staying to the recording studio. And the, this idea hit me. I saw a sign. You've all seen these in the past. I saw a billboard that said, "What would Jesus do?" And uh, that's, that always confused me. I wasn't exactly sure what they were getting at there. But when I was a kid, when we played Cowboys and Indians, uh, uh, 
we, we always wanted to be Roy Rogers. And it was, it was sort of like, what would Roy Rogers do? Because he was, he was the guy that, I mean, this is, he was amazing. Because if you remember those old B movies from the 30s and 40s, he could ride a horse at full speed and shoot the gun out of the hand of another guy riding full speed 100 yards away. This is not easy to do. Um, so we admired Roy Rogers in our, our seven and eight and nine and ten year old uh, minds. We thought this was uh, heroic. But uh, so I came up in, in, the, in the ten miles or so that I was thinking, I came up with a song. I was, was writing, I put a yellow legal pad up on my steering wheel and was writing this uh, song, probably much to the disgust of the people behind me, because um, I was weaving all over the road. And I got to the studio, and uh, we, we laid down, my producer and I laid down a, a track, and in the door walked uh, Johnny Gimble. Does anybody know who Johnny Gimble is? Great Texas fiddle player, won five Grammy Awards. He was Bob Wills' favorite fiddle player. He was Willie Nelson's favorite fiddle player. He died about three or four years ago. Anyway, uh, Larry Nye, you know Larry oh, yeah was talking to Johnny. He said, Johnny, let me play this for you and, and see what you think. So he played this, this song, this scratch track that we had. And Johnny said, I like this. Let me, can I get in on this? And uh, so he went out to his car and brought in his fiddles, tuned them up. And uh, he started playing a little bit on the, on the fiddle. And uh, he was always smiling. He was having fun. And I thought, this is great. I'm sitting here with like the, one of the most famous fiddle players of all time, and he likes my song. And so Larry, the producer, says, Johnny, would you get in the, in, the, in the studio part there and let's just record a fiddle track on this? And then uh, Larry looks at me and he says, do you mind if Johnny Gimble plays on your, your CD? Um, no brainer. Anyway, the, 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 the song came out. It was interesting. It was, a, it was, a, it was, it was what we call on a, on a, on a CD, it's what we call a throwaway song. Most CDs that you buy, most records, you know, two or three, you know, radio play songs, but a lot of them are fillers. I don't like to do that, but this was a hastily done thing, and I thought, well, we just have to fill up this space. Well, the CD came out, and guess which song they picked to play on the radio? They picked this song. It was called Life Was a Whole Lot Better When Roy Rogers Was Around. And we went on tour, played this on tour from, from uh, uh, Hill Country out to... Uh, roughly the Big Bend area, Alpine, and back. We did a final show at Lukenbach, Texas. And everywhere we went, people were singing along, singing this song with us. And I, I said, how do you know the words to this song? I mean, I barely knew the song. And they said, that's the one they're playing on the radio all the time. Then I got a phone call. I was on the road on tour somewhere, and I, I got a phone call from uh, the Western Channel. I don't know if that's still a, it's called the Stars Western Channel. They, they have every year, they have a Roy Rogers Month. And they said, we want to play your uh, Roy Rogers song uh, all through the month of November, three times an hour, 24 hours a day during Roy Rogers month, because they just showed all these old Roy Rogers movies. Plus, we want to, we're going to play it three times an hour, 24 hours a day for the full month of October leading up to this. Can we do that? I said, of course, because you get paid for this. And so, uh, and then it wound up, and again, for a throwaway song, it wound up being one of the most requested songs at, at, at some of my shows over the years, and it still is to some extent, and now I'm going to do it for you. And it, it, uh, if you want, we'll turn it into a sing-along because everybody was singing along with it. The hook line on this at the end of every chorus and every verse is, life was a whole lot better when Roy Rogers was around. Remember that? Can you do that for me? Don't make me come out there. A one, a two, a one, two, three, four. Want to hear some singing out there? I paid my dime, took my seat, watched him right across the silver screen, chasing all the bad guys, saving the town. Here's your part. Life was a whole lot better when Roy Rogers was around. 
It was slower back then and a whole lot sweeter Skies were bluer, grass was greener Nothing bad ever lasted long And nothing much got you down Life was a whole lot better When Roy Rogers was around Roy never gave up, he never gave in He never backed down, he'd always win Never compromised with the bad guys Nobody pushed him around Because life was a whole lot better When Roy Rogers was around I still see Roy riding in my dreams Trigger and Dale still look the same They got me through some hard times and Saw me safe and sound Life was a whole lot better when Roy Rogers was around. Chorus again. Roy never gave up, he never gave in, he never backed down, he'd always win. Never compromised with the bad guys, nobody pushed him around. Because life was a whole lot better when Roy Rogers was around. All right, big finish. Life was a whole lot better Life was a whole lot better Life was a whole lot better When Roy Rogers was around One more time Life was a whole lot better Life was a whole lot better Life was a whole lot better When Roy Rogers was around I paid my dime, took my seat, watched him ride across the silver screen, catching all the bad guys, saving the town. Life was a whole lot better when Roy Rogers was around. Lord, it was a different time back then. Life was good, men were men. Never had no worries, never saw a frown. Life was a whole lot better when Roy Rogers was around. Roy never gave up, he never gave in, he never backed down, he'd always win. Never compromised with the bad guys, nobody pushed him around. Life was a whole lot better when Roy Rogers was around. Slower back then and a whole lot sweeter Sky seemed bluer, grass was greener Nothing bad ever lasted long Nothing much got you down Life was a whole lot better When Roy Rogers was around I still see Roy riding in my dreams Trigger and Dale still look the same They got me through some hard times Saw me safe and sound Life was a whole lot better when Roy Rogers was around. Roy never gave up, he never gave in, he never backed down, he'd always win. Never compromised with the bad guys, nobody pushed him around. Life was a whole lot better when Roy Rogers was around. Life was a whole lot better. Life was a whole lot better Life was a whole lot better When Roy Rogers was around Life was a whole lot better Life was a whole lot better Life was a whole lot better When Roy Rogers was around But right now, I want to find out what was the inspiration on Keep the Bullets Flying, a book that you two wrote together? So I want your take on that first, Russ. Well, we had a jolly time because um, I've, most of my books are fiction. Most of his are nonfiction. And um, he'd done a few fiction books, but we just thought for a lark we'd do it together. Now, um, 
W.C. was the guy who was the head of the judges for the Western Writers of America to, to uh, analyze who got the Golden Spur Award and things like that. And so he's, he dealt with fiction a lot. But with his background, Treasure in Mind, just on all the other Indian materials as well, um, we just decided to take off running. So he wrote a chapter that's set near where he grew up, down in the border. And um, we had a lean, lanky character. And uh, he was, uh, his character slowly developed from chapter to chapter. I'd, he'd write a chapter, I'd write a chapter, he'd write a chapter. And we, we grew into what kind of guy this was. And he was the kind of guy you'd want to hang out with. You know, he was a good guy for the right side. He, he was stand up for people, didn't abide any bullying or, or being pushing around. He was an eloping couple trying to get away from their family. There's posses. And, and as we went through, I'd get surprised. I mean, I'd get a chapter back from him, and he'd punch the guy in a saloon, you know. And I thought, well, I, I can deal with that, because you know, it just it was the guy that had a good punch coming. So uh, I learned a lot, and, and he flexed with that. And then we'd go back and forth over it. And in the end, I went through the smoothing editorial round a few okay. times. And what was the setting on that book? Did it take place in a certain town? Tell us about that. It was in, I'm trying to think of the years, but about 1870. 1870, about, in my mind, about 1873 or so. And uh, you're post-Civil War, but you're still, the, the West is a little rough and tumble. And uh, you had a lot of things going on. And uh, the Kiowa and the Comanche were still a prevalent force, and they're, they're in the book. And uh, so we, we had, they had all the, um, we had some saloon activities. We had uh, um, chases. We had, uh, uh, Good times around there, but uh, it was a—I mean, it, it was a different world than it, you wouldn't see it like we have now with all the growth because there weren't fences, and so right. the Indians would burn off the land every year so the buffalo would come down. Well, then when the buffalo were gone, which is about this turn of the—I call it a hinge of time—and th those are exciting times to write about for us because change is happening and you can feel history. And so that's, that's where uh, W.C. came in. What do, you, what do you remember about the book? And what was your take on it? My take is uh, I, I went into this kind of uh, blind and, and halfway terrified. Uh, <laughs> Russ is a novelist. Uh, I've written three novels, uh, including this one. Uh, and uh, of my however many books I've written, my agent says it's over 100. Most of those are nonfiction, and I've always been attracted to writing novels. In fact, I'm writing one, trying to write one right now. So when we came up with this idea, I thought, well, this ought to be fun. It's Number one, it's fun hanging around with, with Russ, because um, we combine uh, writing with good conversation, good food, maybe a glass of wine or two. And uh, mostly I learn stuff, but I thought, well, I'll, you know, I'm going to jump in on this and try not to appear any more of an idiot than I normally do. And uh, so I wound up writing the first chapter. Uh, and I, and it, I, it's, the first chapter is actually based on a true experience, one, one of mine. And, uh, but I, I, I put it in a, uh, I fictionalized it, and then I sent it to him. The deal was I would write a chapter, send it to him. He would write a chapter, and then there would be two chapters, and he'd send it to me. I would read what he wrote, and then I'd write a chapter, and we went back and forth. So I sent him my chapter. He corrected all my mistakes and then wrote his chapter and um, sent it to me. I couldn't find any mistakes that he wrote. And so now I'm writing chapter three. And so what are we at, 25 chapters in this book or something? And it, by the time we got finished, it was, it was an interesting journey. It was a, it was a, thrill, a thrill a minute uh, thing. Uh, because there's a, there's a lot of action adventure. There's there's uh, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, some female intrigue uh, in there, and um, outlaws, uh, lost silver mine, and they're uh, riding across Texas. And it was a, it was a great it was a great uh, romp. I learned enough about writing fiction to 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 think. That I wanted to do more of this, and I'm 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 actually trying. I've got a little downtime right now in between other book contracts, and so I'm going to try to write another novel just based on the inspiration of working with us on this one. Well, and I'll say that uh, fiction, a, a book like this, is a bit like the opposite of life. 
in life, if you have a problem or a situation, most of us will sit down and say, I got to fix this. You know, what can I commonsensically do with my abilities to make this resolve itself? Um, fiction is the opposite because no matter what you do, how morally or ethically right your decision is, it's going to go wrong because you've got to go on and on or it's, you've got a short story. Right. So, right. so it's got to get worse and worse, you know, and, and more convoluted and compounded. So we both in this kind of a twister across Texas mentality, um, just let it ride out to all its twists and turns. That sounds awesome. And everything in this book could have actually happened. Okay. I mean, it wasn't Maybe fiction did. to the point where it, was, it wasn't science fiction. It wasn't outrageous or anything like that. But everything in this book actually could have happened. And there were some good relationships. There were, there were uh, uh, the two partners and then the, and then the, and then the female who became uh, part of the whole part of the whole thing. Some, some it would probably make a good movie. Yeah, you? yeah. It, it met Hollywood's uh, obligatory romance rule. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. You know. Well, right now we're going to open it up for the audience to, for them to ask some questions. We know that you guys have worked on so many different projects. And, I, you know, before we end this, I definitely want to find out some things about your new science fiction work. But right now, we're going to turn over to the audience to see what questions that they have. And um, you guys will probably need to talk to this mic so we can listen to your question. Does anyone have a question for these gentlemen? Um, okay. And I hope this time that the ants are nothing from now because I'm probably big enough that I don't need that, but far. <laughs> okay. Um, so, have you all, and I hope I didn't miss this, have uh, you all mentioned how you met one another? How did you all start working together? Well, I. We met in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was gonna I was gonna I'll give the rosy glasses version, but um, the we have a mutual friend Mike Blakely who's, who's who uh, used to live in Marble Falls with me and 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 uh, we were at the same gym and and we wrote and so uh, I went to the uh, uh, West uh, Western Writers of America uh, thing where where he was ahead of the judges and things and and hung out and. Uh, um, WC was down doing music with Mike and doing uh, different venues because the the River Grill near me, uh, WC was there all the time and he just was one of the gang, and uh, we just enjoyed each other's company and uh, um, we traded lies and had a good time. Sounds like a great relationship. Thanks. Those were lies. I didn't I didn't mention anyone. <laughs> <laughs> In in your collaboration of the book you both wrote together, yeah, was there? A, did you have to? I mean, I'm I'm assuming that you each had your own style. How did you combine that style, the two different styles, to tell the story? Can I answer that? Sure. Uh, we do have. Uh, Two different styles, but but we we ironed it. We we, we tried to make it okay. uh, seamless. Okay, this this has been done. There are, there are two of my favorite authors. In fact, I just got through reading one of their novels. Is is uh, Doug Preston and Lincoln Child, who write some New York Times bestsellers. These are two guys. One lives in Connecticut. And one lives in Santa Fe, and they they do this. They write. One will write a chapter and email it to the other. Yeah. Uh, but they make it. They make it work. Uh, the reason this book worked is because of his editing. Because uh, he has he has uh, considerably more experience than I have editing. But 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 by the time we got finished, he went through there probably two or three times. Correct me if I'm misrepresenting. He went he went through it about two or three times, and he smoothed things out, transitions and things like that, to the point where it wasn't all that clear. That it was two different people with two different styles writing this thing, so he cleaned it up. Yeah, he cleaned it up nicely. Thank you. Do we yeah. have any more questions? So I have a question. Um, so I'm sure, or at least I expect, when you first started writing, you didn't have computers. It wasn't as seamless to transfer things around and back and forth. So were you? Are you a typewriter? 
initially or handwritten? And now, what's your what's your preference um, in terms of you know? What do, you, do you do an outline, cast of characters, and then you make it all fit together? What's kind of your? I think we just made it up as we went along. <laughs> Yeah, my my rule, and there are people who outline, and I, I, I've i always suspected they can get a little formulaic, because, you know, it says, I need peaks and valleys about now, I need to have something happen like this, and I don't do that. I try to paint myself into a corner I can't get out of, and then somehow get out of it. Sometimes I have to have a, a dream and say, well, that's what's going to happen. And and uh, as things evolve, it's, like I said, it's got to get harder and harder, and things you work out through that you know you you do the impossible sometimes and and that makes it more interesting because if i don't know how it's going to end you won't and that's kind of helps with a mystery in particular um so it's it's my policy not to necessarily outline and, and i have to envision it comes alive in my head i mean the characters are talking to me and i'll be driving along and say i wouldn't have said it that way so i'm pulling over and writing down like uh how they would have said it you know and uh it, it's I think that level of obsession helps that way. With, with history that he does, you just have to know it and then create it so it comes to life in your head, you know. Whereas with, with the uh, fiction, I want it to be a little more spontaneous to where, and that helped with us doing each back because we got surprised, you know. And I'd, uh, I'd send a chapter back and we'd, we're all from the point of view of the Kiowa and the Comanche, maybe. You know, and we had all these things in there. So then he'd come over that and we'd be off and we had the eloping couple. Uh, so, and a posse after them. So it was it was a it was an adventure that way. And and in in all of my books, I mean, I want to be as surprised as the reader. Right. I know not a, a lot of novelists, but I don't I don't I don't know any that actually outline. Uh, I, I, a, a few that are sort of OCD. John Cook being one, mm -hmm. so yeah. he would outline everything precisely. I make up outlines even with with my nonfiction stuff. I start out with an outline because there is a there is a, a, a it's, it's part of the process, and there's a, there's a flow there, and then I ignore it. Uh, simply because as I, as, I, as I get into the writing, things happen that are going to change that outline. Um, and a lot of people say, well, you know, that it's a rule, you need to have an outline. Uh, there are a lot of people that come up and remind me of all these rules in writing. There are rules related to grammar. There are rules related to punctuation, but I'm not sure there are any rules related to writing. You just write. And, you know, part of this is, you know, when we're getting a chapter, mostly it was just getting it down. Get that chapter down, and then we'll clean it up later. But just get the ideas down, the, the flow, the momentum, the energy, and uh, then we'll clean up all of that stuff uh, later. We didn't have any oh, chapters yeah. that dragged, though. I mean, it was all... We all each time we got our hands on it, we wanted to pep it up to the next level and the next level. So it it, it kind of grew, and that's kind of that's kind of the way it should work in a way. But uh, and and make things hard for the other person. Russ would send me a chapter, and it would it would be full of tension and 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 intrigue and everything. And I, dang it, <laughs> now I've got to go one better. And so, right. <laughs> that that you that. You're good at that, though. You one that, up <laughs> that can be good. That can be yeah, good. It well, it brought out the strength in, in each of us. And, and uh... so, do we have any other questions? Man, you guys are easy. I've got a, I've got a question for um, WC there. Um, what part of Texas, being an amateur treasure hunter for your whole life, what part of Texas would you go to to explore and? For someone that's you know just looking to be outside in Texas, learn some Texas history, um, and maybe stumble across something. I would uh, Texas of all of the uh, fifty states. We still just have fifty states. <laughs> I don't get out much. So. <laughs> um, Texas probably has more lost mines and buried treasures, I would say, than, than any other state. It's almost like a country in itself. Uh, when we started doing these lost mines and buried treasure books, the, the publisher wanted region. The first, the first book was lost mines and buried, or was buried treasures of the American Southwest. Okay, and so we had all the Southwest. Then we did the Appalachians, the Ozarks. Uh, and I argued, I said, you know what? Texas is actually a region. It's, it's actually 
a region. At one time, it was its own country. And so I argued that we do a book on Texas uh, uh, completely. And it's, it, it's one of the best selling of that whole, that whole series. But I would say, and this isn't a, a, a pitch or anything, get the Buried Treasures of Texas book, and you'll, you'll read about lost mines and buried treasures all around the state. Pick one. And, 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 and I've had people using my books because they know I do the research. They know I do the investigation. They'll use my books sometimes as a starting point, and then they'll go a few steps further. And we have had uh, people actually find stuff based on what, you know, what they got started on uh, with my book. In one case, when I was writing about uh, buried, a buried Confederate treasure, treasure in, the, in uh, North Carolina, I communicated with some guy that wanted me to share my information and stuff like that, and I shared what little I had. And then also made some suggestions and everything else. And anyway, he went, uh, applied himself, and he found this. This was uh, 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 portions of the Confederate treasury that were buried in multiple different locations along the side of a railroad track. He found six of them, and these were cook pots filled with uh, gold coins part of the Confederate Treasury, and uh, he sent me a, uh, what he called a gratitude check for helping him out. I was happy to, happy to cash. So uh, it happens. This has happened uh, to me at, on at least, I think I've got this right, on at least six different occasions that people using my books um, have found stuff. And then other stuff that I've written about that I have found other people have gone into the places that I've written about, and they have gleaned even more uh, stuff uh, where I've been. That was book in itself. It was. It still is. <laughs> awesome. That, that's absolutely amazing. You know, I, I think in the book of the, the Love and Pirates, it has a lot of treasure, hunting, mm -hmm. adventures, mystery. How do you come up with the idea of the process of building your characters? Um, do you write the story first or do you have in mind the characters first? Well, I always start almost every book with a moment of tension. And a moment of tension reveals a lot about character. And that gives me my first blueprint of what kind of person this is. How do they rise above that particular situation? How do they get through it? And if you remember the first chapter, he's got some bullies picking on him. And, 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 and how does he get through it? Uh, he shows his character. And as I watch him in action, in my head like it's a movie, um, I, I put that down so you can feel it and see it in your head. And as that happens, that character evolves. And there have got to be people I'd like to be around. I want my uh, character has to be likable, yet it can be tough. Uh, it can, uh, 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 or she, in this case, because she's pretty tough too right. in that. Right. But uh, and the dog was pretty tough. Oh, yes, the dog <laughs> is very tough, and I, I liked his role as being a protector. Yeah. You know, and the characters Hardy and Ivy, they were a team, and you were often stumbled as far as trying to find out the outcome before you read it. You had to actually read it to see the outcome. You couldn't guess it. And that's another thing that I really liked, the element of surprise. I thought it was Well, and, and in the first, um, he's trying to distance himself from Ivy because he, he's, not, he's not coming from a family of money, and she is. She, her dad owns a yacht he cleans. And, and he doesn't necessarily feel inferior, but he just doesn't want to start something like that. And she kind of... Uh, works around that. She did. She did. She did a really good job of that. And um, I want to go ahead and just ask some questions as far as we know, WC, that you did some work on National Treasure. Tell us about that and what that experience was like. The, she's talking about the movie National Treasure that starred uh, Nicolas Cage. I got a call from uh, uh, Jerry Bruckheimer, he was the producer, his studio, it was, it was the Disney Studios, he was the producer. And uh, they asked me if I would be willing to uh, look at this script. 
and do an evaluation uh, relative to uh, 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 if it would work or not. And, and my first response was, why did you, why are you calling me? Because, I may be telling you more than you really want to know. I said, how did you get my name? And she said, well, we, we talked to some other professional treasure hunters, and they said, you're the one that we need to talk to. And I thought, well, crap. Um, that's all right. It's okay. How about that? I, I said, uh, and, and I declined at first, and the reason is, uh, as a professional treasure hunter, it's not in my best interest for people to know who I am and what I do because pretty much everything I do is illegal. Wow. <laughs> uh, if you find a lost treasure, let's say in Texas, there is a salvage and, uh, salvage and recovery law in Texas which covers lost treasure. Uh, it varies from place to place, but they're, they're, they're similar. Uh, if, you, if you find something that is over 50 years old, which most buried treasure is, it is declared by state law an historical artifact and becomes the property of the state. Well, the state didn't help me with my research. They didn't fund my expedition. They, take, they didn't take any of the risks. They didn't help me recover. They didn't do anything else. But now they want me to turn it over to them. And uh, I have a problem with this. The laws, is this, is this being taped? <laughs> The laws are absurd. The, the laws uh, turn well-meaning, well um, serious researching and, 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 and working treasure hunters into outlaws. Uh, so when I recover something, uh, I, I hesitate about uh, sharing it with people that didn't, didn't help me. And I, don't, I, I do share what I find. I've given away a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of stuff over, over the years. But... Uh, this imbalance bothers me. Anyway, I explained this to the to the to the um, the very charming lady that was talking to me. But she she convinced me that I needed to do this. And uh, they I was living in uh, Woodland Park, Colorado at the time. And she said, uh, I'm gonna, "We're going to book a flight, and we'll be there uh, in the morning at nine o'clock at your house." And sure enough, at nine o'clock in the morning, they uh, they were there. It was the, it was the, the the associate producer, a cameraman, and a lighting per, lighting sound person. And so we did some discussion and some some stuff. We went out to a ranch and we did a kind of a little silly reenactment. This is all, by the way, if you have a the DVD of the National Treasure, there's a what do they call it a, a special, special features feature, yeah. thing that where this interview is on there. And this little silly reenactment. <laughs> Treasure recovery has changed quite a bit since I started. I still pursue the quest much like I did 40 years ago. I revel in going out into the field and in searching. Others tend to be more high-tech oriented. We have at our disposal these days a lot of technology, including sonar and precise metal detection. For what we look for, that is the buried treasure, the hidden caches. We found these tools not to be that useful to us. Most of what we look for is hidden so well that metal detectors don't reach it. It's basically the dogged work in the field, which is what we love. And tie the animals to that tree over there, and then we can do the rest of it on foot. For a young person interested in treasure hunting as a way of life, you have to understand that a great deal of this involves research. Probably 90% of any hunt involves research in the libraries, studying topographic maps, geologic maps, to try to get some feeling for what you're up against. We have come to appreciate the history to the point where we chase down the history with the same energy that we chase down the treasure. And then, uh, then we met in, uh, in Nevada, in the desert, where they did some more interviewing. Anyway, um, I agreed to do it against, against my will, but it turned out to be kind of fun. I really like these people. And uh, so the movie came out. The, the, the movie came out when I evaluated the script, I said this, the script is ridiculous, but it's really, really fun because the, the timeline was constricted to like, what, 12 or 18 hours or something like that, and this whole thing would have taken years to, right. to materialize. I said, this is nuts, but boy, is it ever fun. And plus, I like Nicolas Cage. 
So I didn't have anything major against it. So uh, the movie came out, it was number one, and they wanted to put all this interview stuff on the special features thing. And the interesting thing was to me, after the movie came out, publishers contacted me and they said, can you do a book for us on these famous, uh, these treasures related to American history, like, like on National Treasure? And I said, that was made, that wasn't real. And they said they didn't care. <laughs> And I said, well, I don't, you know, I, I do, I do the, 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 uh, the, the legend, the, 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 uh, the stories and other things, and I treat them as, as, uh, with respect as history and try to. And uh, so anyway, I wound up doing a book. You've got it over there. It's called Lost Treasures, Lost Treasures in American History. And it wound up being a regional bestseller, whatever that means. And, uh, when the book came out, this is, by the way, two of the stories out of this book, the treasures were found as a result of people reading the book and going over. One of them is in South Texas. Uh, the treasure hasn't been recovered. They found where it is, but it's, it's a logistical nightmare. And the other one was in Vermont somewhere, I think. And um, because of all of the publicity relative to the movie and then people finding these, these, these treasures and things like that, I had more publishers contact me and then TV people wanting me to be uh, part and parcel of, of series and documentaries and things related to Lost Minds and Buried Treasure. And so when I get on TV talking about something like this and, and my name is on there and, and after the TV appearance the book sales spike and everything. Publishers notice this, so even more publishers come and say, we want to get in on this, will you do a book for us? And so I, I don't even like doing TV, I gotta tell you. I don't like, uh, I don't like doing those shows, I don't watch those shows. I, when I do get to see one that I'm on, I'm usually uh, 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 appalled at, at, at what I see. Uh, I, just, I just don't like them because they're somewhat superficial, but I do cash their checks. And uh, and I do appreciate the fact that those propel the, the, the book sales, which then propels more TV, which propels, it's, it's just a vicious circle that uh, I'm, 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 I'm happy to be part of, quite frankly. Well, you do a good job at it, and we just want to say thank you. Did you guys have any other questions that you'd like to ask? I have one to say the question. Do you know anything about the uh, lost death? Yes, sir. And where is that located? Arizona, Superstition Mountains, Arizona. Yeah, just briefly, so much has been written about that, it's hard to separate the, uh, the, uh, the reality from the, you know, men do this. Every time a story is told, and these stories have been told for the last couple of hundred years, every time the story is told, it's told maybe a little bit better than it was the last time. And so by the time it gets to present day, it's hard to tell what really happened. Um, it's not so much that that mine is lost. The mine was probably played out, and uh, the uh, a lot of the the gold that was taken from that mine. You can find gold in the Superstition Mountains, but the gold that was taken, a lot of the gold that was taken from that mine, it was packed into leather packs and loaded onto about 18 mules or burros, and it was being uh, carried out of the Superstition Mountains when it was attacked by Indians. The Indians didn't care anything about the gold. They wanted the mules, and they didn't. They resented the intrusion in their territory, so they they cut the bags of gold nuggets off of the mules, slashed the bags. This was in a stream bed that this happened, and so all of these nuggets uh, fell into the stream bed. You can go to that stream today, and you can actually pan those nuggets out of that stream. That's where the gold is. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. We're getting ready to wrap it up, but I'd like to ask on your science fiction works to give us an example of each book that you've written for your science fiction work well the the, uh, the one the one over there is uh, inside Jupiter and um, I was in the dentist's office having the usual apprehension about that and I was looking out the window at the parking lot and I got thinking what would it be like if there was a butterfly so big that it could pick up a car and crush it like a paper cup <laughs> and um, I, it occurred to me that I could build a whole planet like that and so I just took off of these kids who end up inside, and no one in the book is over 18. I think the, the heroes are like 12 and 14. And uh, 
they they get inside Jupiter and and the insects have become huge. You've got uh, praying mantis as big as giraffes and and uh, uh, all kinds of things. And, and most of the things want to eat you. So um, and there's a lot of rivalry because they're the new kids in there. And so I, I, I then I, I have more series that will come out. There's um, the spider wars and the uh, uh, I've got invisible spiders that come swinging in on you. Well, we look forward to that. And WC, do you have your um, science fiction information? I don't uh, write science fiction. Write I science don't. Uh, I don't even read science fiction. Uh, I have enough uh, trouble keeping up with what I'm already doing. Well, it's it's absolutely. It's, it's like anything else when you research it. I I didn't. There is, as far as I know, there is no inside of Jupiter. Um, but I made it so that you could go through the dark spot and get in there. And there was a whole world with artificial light that could be there. And as I did this, it's based on scientific fact that if it were true, this would be how it would be. So I'm sure Jules Verne and all these folks had things like that going on. But but it, but you can. It's kind of unlimited. So you can you can make a world entirely with its own rules. So that was the fun part. Thank you. Well, we're going to end this, and we just want to say thank you so much for your time, and we just want to say thank you, guys. Thank you.